Wow, clapping for the video, all right, I like it, I like it. Well, welcome to Church Indeed, it's great to see everybody. In fact, um, can we get a little more house lighting? I kind of like to see faces uh, so that I know who I'm preaching to. Um, there we go, there you are. It's great to see you all this morning. Welcome to uh, Indian Rocks Baptist Church. My name is Aaron Philippone, and starting today, I'm one of the pastors here, so it's good to be with you. Great to be here and great to meet so many of you. And uh, it's nice to see that you've been surviving the Arctic weather, the cold front here in Pinellas County. I've seen lots of parkas and sweaters and earmuffs all coming out. It's really, really good. Uh, most people, when they move here, they're moving down to get here to Pinellas County. We actually moved up from West Palm Beach. And so we're freezing. Like, I'm not going to lie. This is really, really cold this week. And uh, I don't know if it's always like this, but we're going to need more clothes. So, um, Hopefully we'll, we'll get used to it. Hey, we're glad to be with you, and it's really exciting that we get to come and, and partner with you and be a part of what God is doing here. Um, it's great to meet many of you. If you're new around here, I'd love to meet you and welcome you here to the church. I'm brand new, so we can learn names together and figure out uh, the lay of the land here together, but we're really, really glad that you're here. You have found a very good church. These are great people. Uh, you're gonna meet some of the, you're, you're not gonna meet perfect people, but these are some of the best people in all of Pinellas County, and they really will love you, and they'll care for you, and this is a great place where you can partner with people as you grow in your, in your walk with Christ. So we're really glad that you're, that you're here. Uh, many people have asked me why I have decided to move here, uh, which is a really good question. So we're coming from West Palm Beach, and we've been there for the last 13 years, and we were a part of a great, thriving ministry. The church that we were a part of was called Family Church, and uh, when we went there, our church was one church in one location, uh, meeting in with one language in English in two services. And that's what we were, meeting in downtown West Palm Beach. And today, as that church is having worship services, they're meeting in 15 different locations across three counties. I don't even know how many worship services and in four different languages. And God has just blessed that ministry um, in so many ways. And it was so much fun for us to get to be a, to be a part of it. And we loved it there. Um, my kids love it there. Every single one of their friends is in Palm Beach County. Uh, and I know what you're thinking. Yeah, but it's got to be easy for you to move here because pastors live such charmed lives and you guys don't have real problems. You know, you guys are removed from all those problems because you know you have God and everything. And you probably just leave church and go home and read the Bible and pray all day. That's probably what you do at your house. And I wish I could say that that were true, but it's not. Uh, we have what I like to call a real family. I have a real marriage. I have real children with real testosterone uh, and real challenges and lots of hormones flying around. We have teenagers. Uh, I have real in-laws. <laughs> I just realized they're probably really watching this. <laughs> <laughs> Pastors don't get special charmed lives. We don't live these Norman Rockwell painting lives, okay? We have real lives. And so I'm trying to live out my life as a Christian just like many of you are. And so to move here was not easy. I mean, it's a challenge. I've got all my kids with all their friends. We have great neighbors, a great home, a great church. Why in the world would I uproot my family and move hundreds of miles away to do something different at this season of life? We have a ninth grader, an eighth grader, a fifth grader, and a kindergartner. Uh, when, when we finally pulled out of the driveway, everyone was crying. I mean, I think even the dog was crying. Like we had tears coming from our dog and it's emotional. So why would we do that? Why would I change everything in our family's lives? Why would we do all of that? I mean, these are some great, great people, but why would I do that? And here's why. And I want you to know this on the front end. The, the reason why we are here and the reason why we decided to uproot our lives and plant our lives here is because we believe that God is sending us here to partner with you to reach Pinellas County and beyond with the gospel of Jesus. That's why. So there's no other reason. We are here to partner with this church to help reach Pinellas County and beyond with the gospel of Jesus. And to be honest with you, that's not just why I'm here. If you're a Christian, that's why you're here. God brought you here for that reason. Now you might be thinking, yeah, but actually I came here because I wanted warmer weather, and boy did you get tricked this week. Uh, or maybe I moved here because I wanted to be closer to the beach, or I wanted to eat better seafood, or I wanted to be here because of a job opportunity, a school opportunity. I moved here to be closer to family, or maybe I moved here to be further away from family. I moved here for all kinds of different reasons. No, God had you here because he wants to partner with you 
to help reach this region and beyond with the gospel of Jesus. That's why you are here. You are an ambassador for Christ. You are a missionary for Christ. And God has brought you to this region to help reach these people for Christ. Now, you may have thought that you were moving here for warmer weather, but boy, did you have it wrong. God has you here to reach these people for Jesus. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about the gospel. And if you have a Bible, why don't you go ahead and open to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Five. The one reason that we are here together is to help reach this region and disciple people for Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 17, says this. If anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Now pause right there. If you're a believer in Christ, if you're a Christian, if you've given your life to Christ, this is what's happened in your life. There was a point in time when you crossed over. You became a Christian. You see, Christianity does not happen by accident. It doesn't happen by osmosis. It happens in a period of time. Theologians call it punctiliar conversion. It's the time that you cross over from death to life. You don't just become Christian-ish. You become a Christian. And so when that happens in your life, you become a new creation, The old has passed away and the new has come. And who is doing this in your life? Verse 18 tells us all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, God saved you and then he gave you a purpose. He gave you a mission. So he didn't just save you to sit and soak and become a smarter sinner. That's not why he rescued you. He rescued you and sent you on mission with a purpose because you were reconciled and he gave you this ministry of reconciliation. Look at verse 19. That is that in Christ, God was reconciling, get this, the world to himself. The whole world is being reconciled to God, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. You know, the whole world is feeling beat up right now. I mean, my goodness, we feel the weight of our trespasses against a holy God. And what St. Paul is telling us here in 2 Corinthians is that God is not counting our trespasses against him. And he's entrusting us with this message of reconciliation. That means you, Christian, have been given this, this pearl of great price. You've been given this treasure that was hidden in a field. You've been given this incredible message of the gospel that changes lives. And you have it if you're a believer. And you don't just have it to hold on to it. You have it to extend it to the watching world all around you. And that means that God has brought you right here to Pinellas County at this time for this reason, for these neighbors and these coworkers and these classmates and all of these people that God is putting in your path. You are the ambassador for Christ for them. And you're here for that reason. That's why God has you here. You may have forgotten why God has you here, but Paul's here to remind us why we're here. Look at verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. Hey, Christian, you're an ambassador. That means you have a a different king and you're representing a different kingdom. You're not representing the kingdoms of this world. You have a, a different king, a holy king, a righteous king, and you have been given this message of reconciliation, and we, we call that message the gospel. Now, if I were to grab a microphone and come around, you know, Oprah Winfrey style and try to interview each one of you and ask you what the gospel is, I would get a, a bunch of different responses. Uh, in fact, some of you have no idea who Oprah Winfrey even is, and I understand that, and I'm aging myself right now. I got it. Uh, but if I were to interview you and ask you what the gospel is, some of you would say, oh, the gospel. Oh, that's like, you know, the good news. Yeah, good news. Okay, but what is the good news? And if you've been to seminary, you might say, oh, well, it's euangelion, you know, the good news. It's, it's Greek. It's a Greek word. Okay, great. You know Greek. But what is the good news? Well, you might say, oh, the gospel, you know, that's the first four books of the New Testament. You know, uh, the gospel, of, uh, what are their names? Uh, John and the gospel of um, Paul and Ringo, and um, that's the Beatles. 
Okay, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Yeah, okay, the first four books, they're called the Gospels, but what is the good news that they're writing about? Some of you might say, well, gospel, that's my favorite genre of music. You know, that good old-fashioned gospel music. I love that gospel music. Okay, but what are they singing about? And what is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John writing about? And what is the good news? St. Paul's gonna tell us. He, de- he defines and describes exactly what the gospel is. And if you have your Bible, why don't you open to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I was interviewing someone one time for a pastoral leadership program at my previous church, and we always ask guys, what is the gospel? And he said, well, the gospel to me is I was in the Walmart parking lot, and I was in my car, and all of a sudden I felt like a warm blanket covered me. I said, okay, that was something, but that is not the gospel, okay? Some people will say the gospel is every good thing that happens to you. The gospel is the trees and the grass and the ocean, and every time you see nature, that's the gospel. And I understand why people would say that, but St. Paul would say that is not the gospel. He tells us exactly what the gospel is. The gospel is not everything. It's something, and here's what he says it is. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the gospel is this, verse 1. Now, I would remind you, brothers... You get a clue in on who he's talking to. Is he talking to Christians or non-Christians? Christians. He calls them brothers. They're in the family of God. He's reminding the believers what we already believe. And isn't it true, Christians, that you have to be reminded of the gospel from time to time? I mean, all of us do. We have to be reminded what we actually do believe. This is what Paul's doing. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel. I preached to you. So they've already heard this message. They've already believed this message, which you received and which you stand and by which you're being saved if you hold fast to the word I preached to you unless you believed in vain. Verse three, here's what he's gonna tell us, the gospel right here. For I delivered to you as of first importance. You may wanna underline that. First importance, we're gonna come back to that. What I also received. So Paul had to receive this message too. Okay, he didn't invent this message. He received this message that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. This is the gospel. So if you were to ask Paul what is the gospel, he probably wouldn't mention Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He probably wouldn't mention gospel music. He wouldn't mention anything about euangelion. Well, he he might, but he, he would say it in a different kind of way. He would say the gospel is this. Jesus died on the cross for our sins, He was buried, and God raised him on the third day. This is the gospel. That's the gospel message. So when people ask you what is the gospel, you tell them Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He was buried, and God raised him from the dead. In fact, we made it really simple. I put it on the screen for you, okay? Really, really simple. You may want to jot this down. St. Paul's the one that wrote it. But here's what the gospel is, that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He was buried, and God raised him on the third day. Hey, since it's my first day here, would you just humor me for a moment? Why don't we all stand together and let's practice the gospel as a church family. Okay, let's practice this together. Everybody stand together. Stand together. All right, church family. What is the gospel? Jesus. He was. And God. This is the gospel. Amen. Give yourselves a hand. All right, stay standing. Stay standing. All right, do you think you can do it if I take it off the screen? Okay, everybody look at it. Everybody look at it. Here we go. All right, let's take it off the screen. Church family, what is the gospel? Jesus, he was, and God, on the third day. Amen. Give yourselves a hand. Great job. Great job. All right, you guys can have a seat. This is the gospel. And as we're walking around town, as we're meeting people here in our community, I don't ever want the members of Indian Rocks Baptist Church to, get, to, to, to fumble on this one. Okay, there's a lot of other theological doctrines and issues that we can, bum, you know, you know, we can mess it up or we can uh, you know, not say it right. But on this one, we've got to be able to tell people what the gospel is. That Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He was buried and God raised him on the third day. This is the gospel. This is the message. And for St. Paul and for us, this is of first importance. It's the most important thing that we could talk about. The gospel. The gospel. Jesus died for our sins. He was buried. God raised him from the dead. When you trace through uh, the book of 1 Corinthians, you'll see that Paul mentions this over and over again. Now, Paul could have talked about a number of different issues, 
The Corinthian church had all kinds of struggles. And if you study through the book of 1 and 2 Corinthians, you'll see it all over the place. I mean, there was drunkenness. Uh, there was idolatry. They were worshiping idols. Uh, there was fornication, adultery, orgies, all happening in the temple of Aphrodite as an act of worship. I mean, they thought that's how you worship God. And so Paul could have written about a number of these issues, but what you'll find when you study the book is that he comes back to this one central issue over and over and over again, the gospel. And so those other issues, yeah, they're important, but they're nowhere near as important as the gospel. The gospel is primary. It's of most importance. It's of first importance. Many leadership gurus, even in the Christian world, will tell you that all theological doctrines are on equal plane. You know, if you'll just practice these seven habits of highly effective people, you'll be a good Christian leader. Or if you'll just uh, try out these 21 irrefutable laws of Christian leadership, you'll be a good leader. And I understand why they would say that, but for Paul, not all issues are equal. There are some issues that are important, and there are other issues that are just not as important. Theologians have a way of ordering doctrines and I think it was Al Mohler who came up with this probably about 20 or 30 years ago. He calls it theological triage. Theological triage. And we have a little graph that we'll put up on the screen here. But this is a way for you to think about and prioritize uh, Christian doctrine. Now, we understand the word triage, especially if you're in the medical community, right? Let me give you an example. Uh, let's say you're in the garage and you're doing some house projects. And uh, all of a sudden, you're using a box cutter and you slice your hand open. Oh, and you're bleeding all over the place, and you get the gauze, and you wrap it up, or maybe you get some butterfly band-aids, and you quickly realize, I need stitches. So you get in the car, and you head down to the ER, and you check in at the, at the hospital, and they're going to put you in something called triage. How many of you have ever been in triage in the hospital before? Okay, you know what I'm talking about. So if you cut your hand open, you're probably going to sit there in triage for a couple of hours, right? You fill out the paperwork, which is so cruel that they make you fill that out while your hand is bleeding. And so you fill out the paperwork, you give them the insurance information, you're all checked in, and there you are sitting and waiting. And maybe after two hours of waiting, someone gets rushed in on a gurney and they're having a heart attack. Now, who are they going to see first? You, who's been there waiting patiently for two hours, having already filled out the paperwork and the insurance, and you're there bleeding to death. You or the guy that's having a heart attack right now? Who are they going to see first, heart attack or the hand cut? Heart attack. Why? Because it's more important. It's life or death. It's a more important issue, and the same is true in our theology. When it comes to Christian doctrine, there are certain issues that are top-tier, first-priority issues. And for St. Paul, he would say the gospel message is of first priority. So St. Paul wouldn't put it here. He would put it here. I mean, it's like at the pinnacle. It's at the very top of the pyramid. Why? Because it's of first importance. You know what the first important issues are in Christian doctrine? It's the Apostles' Creed. How many of you grew up in a church saying the Apostles' Creed? Yeah, I did, all right? We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. You guys remember the Apostles' Creed? These are essential to Christianity. In other words, if you deny those things, you're probably not a Christian. These are essential to being a Christian. But within Christianity, there are other distinctives, other doctrines that we hold to that are important, but they're not first-tier issues. These are what I would like to call denominational distinctives. So at our church, we have some denominational distinctives. We believe in something called eternal security. What we mean by that is once you become a Christian, you can never not be a Christian. Once you're in the Father's hand, nothing can pluck you out. Once saved, always saved. We believe in eternal security. Another one here that we hold to is um, we, we have a very distinct view on baptism. We believe in what's called believer's baptism by immersion after conversion. Okay, that's what we hold to. So every time we baptize here, you're not going to see sprinklings. We're not going to baptize infants here. We have a very specific way that we baptize. But right down the street, we have brothers and sisters in the Presbyterian and Methodist church that do it differently. And it's totally fine. It is their right to be wrong on these issues. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> we, but we have a way that we do it, right? We baptize by immersion after you become a believer in Christ. That's how we do it. These are denominational distinctives. So these would be tier two issues on our theological triage when it comes to our doctrines. And then there are theological preferences. 
In fact, in a room like this, there are going to be a myriad of different theological preferences all over the map. Okay, let me give you a few examples. So uh, when it comes to creation, uh, there's a lot of debate, debate about how old the earth is. And so I would be what you would call a young earth creationist. So I, I, I believe that the earth is about 6,000 years old. But there are other believers, maybe even many in this room, who would have a different view on that. And that's totally fine. It is your right to be wrong. It's okay. I'm just kidding. Um, it's totally fine. We're going to have disagreement even within the church body. There's disagreement about the dinosaurs, right? Like, how about the dinosaurs? And everybody always wants to know about the dinosaurs. There's disagreement about eschatology, which simply means, you know, how things are going to unfold in the end. Pre-mill, pre-trib, post-trib. Everybody has a different view, and it's totally fine. We can, we can have differing views on these theological doctrines and still be a part of the same church family together. It's totally fine. And so there's going to be disagreements here, but we can never disagree on these issues. Never. These are top-tier theological issues, and if you don't hold to these, you're probably not a Christian. So St. Paul would say, I want to remind you, brothers, of that which is of first importance, that Jesus died on the cross for our sin. He was buried, and God raised him on the third day. This is the gospel. And if you trace through the book of 1 Corinthians you're gonna quickly see that Paul runs back to this over and over and over and over again. In fact, how many of you grew up in a church where you did something called Bible drill? Anybody ever do Bible drill? You guys know what that is? Where you know, they call out a verse and they make you look it up real quick? Okay, let's do some Bible drill. If you have a Bible, get your Bible out, turn your Bible on, get it open. Let's turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter one. 1 Corinthians chapter one, I want you to see a couple of verses here. And I want you to see how Paul prioritizes this message of the gospel over every other message. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, look at verse 17. 1 Corinthians 1, 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the what? The gospel. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Was Paul against baptism? No, he was totally for it. I mean, I actually think he went to the first Baptist church of Jerusalem. I mean, I think he was a Baptist. I think he loved baptism. But is this why he came to preach? No, he wasn't just preaching a message of baptism. He was preaching the message of the gospel, that God can change lives because of the resurrected Christ. That's the message he was preaching. Look at 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2. Flip over to verse, chapter 2, verse 2. Chapter 2, verse 2. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Hey, let me ask you a question. Uh, did Paul possess other knowledge? Yeah, not a trick question. Of course he did. Paul was brilliant. I mean, this guy was trained under Gamaliel. This guy knew multiple languages. He wrote 13 books of the New Testament. This guy is a genius, next level church planter. I mean, he was so sharp. But he says this, I decide to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. What is that? The gospel. I decide to know nothing. In, in, in other words, hey, all the degrees that I've earned, all of the accolades, all of the trophies, Flush them. I decided to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's the most important message I can give to you. And Paul is telling us of what is of first importance to him. It's the gospel. He surrenders his, his God-given scholastic giftedness in order to prize the gospel message above all else. In chapter 3, Paul uses the gospel to address divisions in the church. He runs straight to the gospel. In chapter four, he uses all this family language, familial language about how the gospel binds us together after talking about divisions. And then he makes this beeline straight to the gospel. Chapter five, he talks about sexual immorality and then he uses it as a platform to talk about the gospel. He talks about food laws. He talks about sexual immorality, fleeing idolatry, considering the weaker brother, even head coverings. Like, why would he even talk about head coverings? Because he's talking about all of these hot topic, hot button issues as a platform to talk about the gospel. He's using everyday conversations to have gospel conversations. Flip over to chapter 9. In chapter 9, at the end of verse 12, he says this. This is incredible. He says, we would rather endure anything than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel. Endure anything. I mean, you think about some of the hardships, some of the struggles, the beatings. Think about all that they endured. And he's saying, I would rather endure anything then have someone put an obstacle in the way of the gospel. Look at verse 15, chapter nine, verse 15. I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for sharing the gospel. I mean, you think about the intensity with which Paul is talking to us here. 
Some of us are so impatient, you're going to be beeping at each other in the parking lot on your way to lunch. Paul's saying, I'd rather die than have someone deprive me of the opportunity to preach the gospel. Look at verse 16. Woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. Look at verse 22. To the weak I became weak that I might win the weak. I've become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I do it for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. And this is what led him to one of his most famous verses in 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So, Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do it all for this gospel message that really does change lives. What makes someone talk like this? I mean, what what makes someone abandon everything they know? Paul said of himself, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. That means in the pecking order of Pharisees, he was on his way to the top. I mean, this was a good gig for him. Why would he trade all of that? Why would someone move hundreds of miles and make their kids get all new friends and go to new schools and sell their house? Why? Why would anyone do that? Because the gospel is the pearl of great price. The gospel is the treasure hidden in the field. The gospel is the treasure that's worth selling everything for. The gospel's worth it. And if you're going to be a part of this church, you have to understand that for us here at Indian Rocks, the gospel's paramount. It's the most important thing that we could ever talk about, the most important thing that we could ever discuss. I want to be like Paul, where I can say I've become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. It's as if Paul was becoming an expert at taking everyday conversations and turning them into gospel conversations. You know, if we were walking around in Pinellas County and and the Apostle Paul were here in 2023, I would imagine him walking through the aisles of Publix and uh, you get to the frozen food aisle and there's Paul looking at ice cream. And you say, hey Paul, what's the uh, best kind of ice cream over here at Publix? Is it Briars or is it Bluebell? Now we all know it's Bluebell, right? (laughs) Somebody should have definitely amened right there. I mean, (laughs) thank you. Bluebell ice cream is so good. Is it Bluebell or is it Briars? And Paul's probably thinking in his mind, no question, it's Bluebell. But, hey, let me tell you something that's sweeter than ice cream. The love, the forgiveness, the grace, the acceptance that comes through the gospel of Jesus. And he would take an everyday conversation and turn it into a gospel conversation. You ever done that? Maybe God's calling you to do that as a missionary right here in Pinellas County. That God has brought you here on purpose with the gospel of Jesus to help reach this region for Christ. So what's everybody talking about in our county? What's everybody talking about in our state? What's everybody talking about in our nation right now? Well, uh, if you were watching Monday Night Football, everybody's talking about DeMar Hamlin. How how many of you saw the injury of DeMar Hamlin on Monday night? Anybody see that? Yeah, it's been everywhere, all over the news, right? He uh, made a tackle, stood up just like any other tackle he'd made before, and then collapsed on the field. His heart stopped. And the world gasps, gasped. Everybody saw the video, and instantly he was he was flooded with support from the watching world. It was incredible just to see how the world responded to that to that injury. He was surrounded on the field by members of both teams, praying, encouraging. Prayer gatherings were held all over the nation. Sportscasters were even praying on live TV on ESPN. Did you guys see that? Someone started a GoFundMe account on Monday, and today it has $8 million in it. It's like the whole world was was talking about this injury. So as gospel carriers, how do we turn an everyday conversation into a gospel conversation? Well, instead of just going off on a rabbit trail on the medical condition, instead of just bickering about what the NFL could do to prevent these injuries, what if we said something like, yeah, that was a scary injury, Well, I'm so glad I don't have to fear death. Yeah, that was a scary injury. I'm so glad that our God is sovereign, that he's large and in charge, that he knows exactly about this situation. In fact, he knows everything about you too. In fact, the Bible says that he knows everything about you. He knows how many hairs are on your head or lack thereof for some of you. (laughs) And we don't have to fear death 
because the Lord Jesus Christ, the second member of the Trinity, God himself was crucified on the cross for the sins of the world. He was buried, and on the third day he was raised from the dead, and anyone who trusts in him can have new life, and you'll never have to fear death again. What if God allowed all of us to take everyday conversations and turn them into gospel conversations? We can change this county. We might be able to change the world. God has given us this incredible message, and at Indian Rocks, we're gonna be all about the gospel. It's essential for everything that we do, and here, here's why, I'll wrap up with this. Four reasons why we're all about the gospel. If you're a note-taking kind of person, I'm gonna give you four things you can write down. Number one is this, the gospel ministry is our primary ministry. Without it, we're simply a country club with very expensive voluntary dues. <laughs> The gospel's everything for us. Without the gospel, we're just a bunch of moral do-gooders who don't always do good. The gospel is everything for us. You see, we're not just a bunch of smarter sinners. We have the gospel that has changed our lives. It's radically transformed us. The gospel is our primary ministry. Now, I'm kind of new around here, but I have noticed there are a lot of ministries taking place on this property. Okay, in fact, if you walk out these doors and go down that corridor, on the left, we have something called a cafe. How many of you have ever been to the cafe? Okay, the Indian Rocks food is incredible. My kids went to school on Thursday and Friday, and I said, how was school? And they said, Dad, the chicken fingers are amazing. Okay, so <laughs> it was great, okay? Uh, they love the mango smoothies. Like they love, I mean, the cafe is amazing, right? So we have a cafe. We have this incredible school here, which many of you are a part of, and I'm so grateful for the hard work that you're pouring in to invest in the lives of our students right here at Indian Rocks. You know, we have almost 1,200 students that are coming to school at our school. I mean, you look around this property, we have right, right over here, we have an outstanding preschool ministry. And right now, they are getting to meet my son, Eli, and he's five years old, and God bless the souls that are taking care of my son, Eli, <laughs> right now. We have a, a kids' ministry that is fantastic, and they're over there teaching kids the Bible right now. We have a middle school ministry, which, good Lord, God bless all you middle school volunteers. Thank you for what you do. You are a blessing from God. We have a high school ministry, a college ministry, an adult ministry. I think we even have a quilting ministry. We have missions ministries and prison ministries and rehab ministries. We have so many ministries that are taking place on this campus. In fact, did you know that we have between two and 300 employees who are employed by the church and the school all right here on this property. We have hundreds of volunteers, many of them are you sitting right here, that are volunteering, serving your guts out right here on this property. We have thousands of people who will call this church their home. They'll say, yeah, that's my church. And with all of these ministries and all of these people and all of these activities that are happening, the primary purpose for every one of them is the gospel, the gospel. The reason why we have kids ministry is to advance the gospel. The reason why we have prison ministry is to advance the gospel. The reason why we have deacons and ushers and greeters, the reason why we have cameras and lights and sound is so that we can advance the gospel. We have an entire operations team that is dedicated to making sure the lights come on and the air condition works and the facilities are clean and they do such a great job. But do you know what their primary goal is? Advancing the gospel. That's their number one primary goal. We have a great security team and they're keeping us safe and they're watching you right now and you don't even know where they're at and they're awesome. They're like Jack Bauer. I mean, you don't even know what these people are doing right now and they will introduce you to Jesus one way or another because their primary <laughs> ministry is the gospel of Jesus. That's why we exist. Woe to us if we do not keep the gospel central to everything that we do here. The gospel's number one. The gospel is primary. That's why we exist. Number two, the gospel is verifiable. We are not just some sanctified rotary club, some kind of spiritual Kiwanis club. I'm all for civic groups and I'm very grateful for them, but the reason why we gather together is because of an event that happened 2,000 years ago, that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, he was buried, God raised him from the dead. And right after Paul tells us that, right after he tells us the tenets of the gospel, he wants to remind us that this is an event that's grounded in space-time history. That if you were to get into a time machine and travel back 2,000 years, you would see the gospel taking place in Golgotha. You would see it taking place in a borrowed tomb. A, a guy named Joseph of Arimathea let him borrow a tomb and you would see it happen before your very eyes. And Paul tells us that. Look at verse five. 
1 Corinthians 15, verse 5. He says, and that he appeared to Cephas. You know who Cephas is? That's Peter. That's his, his, his other name. Uh, then to the 12, that's the 12 disciples. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. So what's Paul saying here? Listen, when Paul writes this letter to the church in Corinth, he's grounding it in space-time history, and he's reminding them that this is an event that took place. So he's saying, look, this resurrection, this is, this is not some glorified version of Aesop's fables. This is something that happened and was witnessed by all of these people. Well, who was it witnessed by? Well, Cephas was there. In other words, um, this was written just, you know, not, not too many years after the resurrection. So Paul would probably say, hey, you don't believe me? Hey, Peter, come here, come here. Tell them what you saw, because you saw the resurrection. Oh, you don't believe Peter? Hey, how about the 12 apostles? Come here, guys. Hey, hey, Peter, James, John. Hey, come on over here. Tell them, tell them what you saw. Oh, you don't believe the disciples? You think those are all insiders? How about the 500 eyewitnesses? Hey, you guys, come here. Tell them what you saw, because you saw it with your own eyes, and you're still living and breathing, and right here before us today, you tell them what you saw. Oh, you don't believe them? How about the half-brother of Jesus? How about James? Because no brother would ever say that his brother is the Messiah, but this guy does, so don't you believe him? He's right here standing before you. Ask him. And then he says, it's not just them, it's me. Write this down, number three, the gospel offers new life. The gospel offers new life. Remember, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. But then look what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 8. The gospel came to Peter, came to, to the 12, came to the 500, came to James. And then verse eight, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me. Many of you know the story. He was on the road to Damascus and he was blinded and God miraculously appeared to him. And it's almost like I see Paul getting a little emotional here. Look at verse nine. For I, I'm the least of the apostles. I'm unworthy to be called an apostle. Why? And he knows why. Because I persecuted the church. Many of you know the story of, of Paul. Paul was a bad man. He was a bad mamma jamma. <laughs> Paul was hired to kill the Christians. He, he was there at the stoning of Stephen. He approved of it. His job was to murder Christians, and he thought he was doing it on behalf of God. God, I'm doing this for you. I'm snuffing out this, this group, these naysayers, these these fakes, I'm, I'm snuffing them out for you. And then God appeared to him and said, they're not fake. These are the true believers. These are the way. These are the Christians. And then verse 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. And God took this Pharisee of Pharisees and turned him into this incredible missionary church planter extraordinaire. Changed the entire Greco-Roman world. And we're sitting here today largely because of the works of, of Paul and what he did. So let me ask you something. If God could do this with St. Paul, what do you think he wants to do with you? I mean, why in the world did God bring you to Pinellas County? of all the places that you could be living, of all the places you could be raising your family, of all the places you could be working, why did God bring you here? Hey, let me just poll the room real quick, real quick, just for fun. How many of you were born and raised in Pinellas County? Just raise your hand. Look around, keep your hands up, look around. About 10% of us, maybe. Actually, I shouldn't have my hand up. About 10% of y'all. <laughs> How many of y'all moved here from outside of Pinellas County? Raise your hands. God brought you here for a reason. For some of you, God let you be born here and raised here for a reason. For others, like myself, God brought you here for a reason. Do you know why you're here? You thought it was for warmer weather and good seafood, but that's not why you're here. You are here as an ambassador for Christ. You are rep representing the king of all kings. And he has you here on special assignment 
to reconcile the world to himself. And that's why, number four, the gospel is for everyone. The gospel is for everyone. Look at verse 11. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Faith is an incredible thing because all I can do is preach. You're the one that has to choose to believe. All you can do is preach. Just turn an everyday conversation into a gospel conversation. You're not responsible for the conversion. Only God can do that. Only the Holy Spirit can do that in the hearts of men and women, but we're asking him to do it. And I'm asking that God would do this with tens of thousands of people right here in Pinellas County, that he would allow us to take everyday conversations and turn them into gospel conversations. And so when I stand on the stage and look out at you, I kind of feel like you're an army for God. I I look at this incredible army. I feel like this place, this, this address on Almerton Road is like a Christian Quantico. And we gather together like the huddle of a football game. We gather together to get fired up. We gather together to be brothers and sisters, and then we scatter abroad to be the church out there. We gather together as the church in here, and we scatter abroad to be the church out there. So who's your one? Who's the one man, the one woman, the one boy, the one girl, the one kid, the one grandkid, the one grandparent? Who's the one person that God has on your heart right now? Who's the one person that God has you in Pinellas County to reach? Now look, I want to reach people all over the world, and I really am concerned about Aunt Susie in Wyoming, but I want to reach these people right here. In the book of Acts, they couldn't stop talking about what they had seen and heard. Guys, I want to see it. I want to see it right here in our region. I want to see it right here in our time. I want to see it in our day, and I believe that God's going to let us see it because it's what he wants. He's reconciling the world to himself. He's given us the ministry of reconciliation. He's letting us be a part of it. Why would we squander our opportunity? Why would we miss out? Maybe you have one on your heart, your mind right now. Maybe it's a child, someone that lives in your home. Maybe it's a grown child. Maybe it's a neighbor or a coworker or someone from the ball field or someone from your class. Hey, why don't you do this? Why don't you just write their name down? If you got something to write with or maybe put it in your phone or do something, why don't you just go and write it down? And maybe make it a matter of prayer this week. You're going to commit to pray for this person. You know where evangelism starts? It starts right in here, in your heart. It starts with a Greek word called splagnizomai. (laughs) It means compassion in the guts. God bless you. Yeah. (laughs) Splagnizomai. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed like sheep without a shepherd. He felt it in his guts. When he looked out and he saw the people, he felt it. Do you feel it when you see this community? Do you feel compassion for them? Do you feel it in your guts? Maybe we pray that that's where we begin today. Hey, I want to invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And As we wrap up today, we're going to have many more opportunities to talk about this good gospel. But it really means nothing if we only talk about it in here. We really need to talk about it out there. And God has put us right here in this region at this time with these people for a purpose. Hey, Christian, you are not here by accident. You're the ambassadors to this county. You're the ambassadors to this region. God has brought you here on purpose. And maybe you're here today and you're not really sure if you are a Christian. You hear these things and you like these things and you feel like God is awakening something in your heart. You don't even really know how to explain it, but you feel like you want this. You need that forgiveness. You need that compassion. You need that grace. You need it in your life. You need Christ to come into your life right now. I wanna let you know you're not here by accident either. The Bible says that God numbers our days. He knows everything about you. He knows that you're here right now and he wants to have a relationship with you. And maybe today, for the very first time, or maybe for the first time in a long time, you would just cry out to God. With all the faith that you have, reach out to all the God that you know, and just tell him in your heart, dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that my sin has separated me from you, and right now, I'm trusting in you. Come into my life. Make me clean on the inside. I believe 
that Jesus died on the cross for my sin, that he was buried, and that God raised him on the third day. And so right now, I'm committing to live for you. If you pray that prayer, you're a new Christian. You're a new believer. Many of us in the room right now, we are believers. We've been believers for a long time. And so God, I pray for the Christians in this room that you would deploy them all over this county and beyond with the good news of the gospel. May we see a harvest of righteousness for your name's sake. God, I pray that we would see thousands upon thousands upon thousands of men and women, boys and girls, trusting in you. And may you receive every bit of the glory because you and you alone are the one true and living God. You're the king of all kings. We worship you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.